Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. We're, tonight we have an informational session, and uh, I'll kick it over to City Manager Chad Ubel. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, this is something that we've talked about through the 2022 budget process. Uh, I actually consider tonight the first meeting for 2023 budget. Uh, and the reason why I consider it that is because, again, a lot of the information you're going to see relates to our budgeting process, some of our financial policies, uh, debt, uh, some of those questions that usually come up during the budget uh, process. And so we've asked uh, Baker Tilly uh, to present tonight. Um, toward the end of the presentation, uh, we'll discuss um, ARP funding. And that's where you'll see um, staff's first I guess our initial list of potential items for ARP funding. I'll go over that list with you again. Baker Tilly is going to help us through that slide as well. You're not making any decisions tonight as a reminder. You're not making decisions about the ARP funding. I'll explain a little bit more when that come, when that slide comes up. Again, informational piece. Obviously at the end, Terry and Chris will reserve time if you have if you have questions. So uh, Mayor, with that, we have Terry Heaton and uh, Chris Hogan with us from Baker Tilly. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? A little bit closer? <laughs> Feel like a rock star here. Um, I'm I'm Terry Heaton with Baker Tilly, and um, I'm a partner, and I have been uh working with the city for probably 20 years or so so we've been here a lot i think the last time i was here was to discuss the abatement bonds in 2017 so we have a long history with them and i'm delighted to be here this evening and i'm can you hear me okay yep. and i'm chris hogan um i've been with baker tilly since 2000 so quite a long time i've worked with the winona um on the analytical side of working with bonds and debt management. Um, I'm just really excited to be here and meet all of you in person. So, yep. So we're gonna get started today. What we want to present is just financial management overview. Um, and we're just gonna walk through a few slides and and I, I'm gonna start with our our Baker Tilly team. Besides me and Terry, we have uh, on here three other staff at uh, Baker Tilly that I would like to give you a little bit of background on because they're really um, important pieces to our financing package. So Michaela, uh, she does specializes in economic development, redevelopment, housing, property tax, abatement, um, state and local grants. Shelly Ness, she oversees post issuance compliance. So um, think of arbitrage and rebate, that kind of stuff. Uh, she's been doing that for over 25 years. And Alyssa Glazer, she oversees all aspects of the disclosure. So she works on doing the official statements, um, works on the day of sale, bond sale. She does, um, and she also does closing documents and continuing disclosure. So that is your team. The topics that we'd like to talk about today, I'm gonna to move so I can see a little. Um, we're gonna talk about tax levies and tax impacts, capital budgets and operating budgets. We'll get into future debt issuance, creating credit rating factors. And like Chad said, we'll end up with the ARPA budget. So just to give you a little background of who we are as Baker Tilly, um, the last time, like Terry said, that we've had an opportunity to be here was in 2017. So um, we're excited to be here. It's, it's been a little bit of pandemic. And uh, since that time, we've all seen big changes. One of ours is um, we were formerly Springstead and now we're Baker Tilly. And we're excited about that change. Um, our, our public sector practice is uh, we work with over 3,100 clients. We have 420 public sector practitioners. We have 90 or more registered municipal financial advisors. We are one of the top CPA firms that perform over 500 audits annually. We are the third largest financial advisor with over 350 bond issues annually. And we yet pride ourselves greatly on the personal services that we provide and that we've always provided when we are Springstead. 
I'll hand it over to Terry. All right, thank you all for not running out the door when you saw the topics, <laughs> kind of heavy things, but um, one of the reasons we wanted to, or the, the reasons that we've been asked to talk to you is it's difficult sometimes to be uh, in your position uh, as a city council member and have to answer a lot of questions about the tax system and how it works. And it's complicated to understand. So when constituents come to you and want to understand, you know, how do, how do your decisions impact my bottom line, my taxes? Um, it's, it's a lot to ask. And so just to have some support, some reinforcement for all of you on how it works and so that you can, you can work with your constituents as well. So one of the, the items that often comes up that, that um, you know, because Minnesota is not on a mill system where automatically there's a tax rate and you just generate dollars based on that uh, automatically, um, what, what happens in, in Minnesota is that there is a dollar levy is really what people are paying for. So I'm gonna try to turn my head to the big screen and see if it still works. So <laughs> when the, the county assessor increases the home or property value, a lot of folks believe that immediately there is a tax increase because you got your value from the assessor and so my taxes are going to go up so we'll make sure we you know lock the doors and don't let the assessor in to look and then we won't have to pay more for taxes um, by the way they they have to make some estimate every four years regardless of whether people let them in the house anyway and so um, that doesn't really help them but that is false in minnesota revenues are only generated by the dollar levy that you set and that dollar levy is spread to the the taxes and so just having your value increase if your city does not increase your taxes you're going to it's an allocation method you're still going to be paying the same or or a different a lesser amount depending on on that levy whoops like the second piece is people assume that just because the city council increases the levy that automatically their taxes are going to go up and the other side of that, of course, is taxes are allocated to individual property taxes or spread to them. And so if overall your tax base grows by an amount, so you've got more base to spread taxes against, even though you increase your levy, if your tax base also grows, that's really going to create a tax rate. And that is what is going to have an impact on whether the taxes go up or down. And sometimes when your tax base grows, you actually have to add services or um, you know, increase your levy because you're supporting more tax base as well. And so properties also appreciate differently. So some values may go up or down. And so individually, even though we set a tax rate, it's applied to an individual property value. And so that will also affect how the taxes are allocated and whether the taxes will go up or down. We'll, we'll walk through some examples here. Um, and then the last piece, is that a lot of communities believe that if you just keep it flat that you know keep the levy flat then the taxes won't increase um, or excuse me, so then they also believe that they or they don't understand that you know does this really negatively impact our operations so if you have a, a flat levy for year after year after year Typically, what's going on is that you are um, deferring some capital costs or maybe not keeping up with what is going on out there. And so it has an impact of at some point it catches up to you and all of a sudden you have to have this large increase to make up for this flat tax. Um, it is true that if you keep your levy flat and you have a lot of fat, you know, they've got some room for a few years in there, but eventually without increasing taxes, you end up just deferring costs or not keeping up with today's costs. So this is just a little, a uh, few minutes on uh, how our tax is calculated. They're spread to properties using a tax rate that's determined by taking the levy that is set by the entity and dividing it by the net tax capacity. And that um, it becomes your tax rate. And that tax rate is used to and applied. Um, and so in this case, if your levy was 10,373,000, um, the tax base being about 24 million, that translates into a local tax rate of 43%. And so that is for the city of Winona. This tax capacity, everyone wa always wants to know what is that? Because everyone knows the market value of their house. So what is this tax capacity? Well, it's basically a weighting system. 
and it weights more of the tax allocation to commercial industrial versus residential. And so for instance, residential homestead, if your property is valued, the portion of your property that's $500,000 or less is at 1%. I believe your average uh, home here is closer to just under 200,000. So most of your residential properties are taxed at 1%. Any value over that is at one and a quarter percent. But as you can see on the slide, the apartments are at one and a half percent. Commercial industrial starts the first 150,000 is at 1.5%. And over that is at 150% is at or over 150,000 is at 2%. Sorry about that. And so basically shifts. Uh, so when you do that allocation, you create this, this tax capacity by property. And that is really the, pro the tax base that the levy is spread against. So the example, we are just doing a residential example. And so if you have a $200,000 home, the class rate from the previous page is 1%. And so the tax capacity for that individual property is $2,000. And if we go back to that mill rate, or excuse me, not the mill rate, the tax rate of 43% we calculated by taking the tax levy divided by the tax capacity for the city, it comes up with a city tax of about $861. but the city is not the only agency taxing, levying taxes. And so the full tax bill looks more like this. You have the city rate still at 43.07%, but the school, county, special districts um, make up the difference so that the total tax rate is actually 97%. So 97% is what gets applied. And so what that looks like on the next slide is your two, we go back to the $200,000 home at 1%. That home's capacity, this, the top part is still the same. It's a $2,000 tax capacity on the house. Um, all, now multiplied for all taxing entities, in addition to the city, or including the city, at 97%. And the tax is 1942 And then just flipping back, when it compares to 861 just for the city. So that is the, the tax calculation for a home. Now, back to those earlier slides when we were talking about you know, some of the, the way people look at that, this is just to illustrate again, if the current tax rate, the calculation of 43.07% results in an $861 tax. The second illustration shows that if you just increase the tax levy and keep the tax base the same, the rate will go up. If everything else is the same, of course, because you've got more taxes being spread to the exact same tax base. And so in that case, the rate would go up to 887 again, just for the city. And in the last example, we're showing a tax levy increase of 3%, but in this case, your tax base grows at 5%. And even though sometimes a 3% tax levy seems like a big lift, um, but if your tax base has gone up by 5%, your taxes then uh, your tax rate then will drop because your denominator has also grown to so that your tax rate is 42.25%. And in that case, your tax will actually go down from the current tax rate. And so the tax base has a big role in that. And again, to, to remember to, to explain to the constituents that they really need to understand both to understand what might be happening with their tax base. The other thing that's not in the PowerPoint slide, but if you have folks that move from another community, we have this a lot in the metro area. You know, it's like I moved from Edina to uh, Minnetonka and boy, are my taxes high. Um, and of course they bought, they had a, a, their starter home and they bought something that was, you know, <laughs> quite a bit more expensive, but they're, they are thinking that their tax rate went up because they moved to an expensive city. And of course, the fact that you just saw all of this gets uh, multiplied by the individual tax capacity for each home, which is the real reason that their taxes went up is they bought a much nicer home. The other part of um, taxing that we talk about is structural budgeting. Um, and really what that means is when you adopt the budget, um, you know, when a community does that, balancing for today, balancing for one year, um, 
is good. I mean, that's, that's certainly what you want to do, but also to position yourself with today's levy so that you can forecast and look ahead to the next five years and say, will this levy carry me? Or did we cut enough stuff? So now we're, our base is even lower and we still have to get through the next five years. So, so one of the best practices or things that we talk to folks about is really doing a structural budget so that you plug in this year's budget, some reasonable assumption, uh, or reasonable assumptions for where the expenditures are gonna, expenditures are gonna go and see if over the five years, does it still work or are you leaving yourself so short that it's going to be quite a climb to be able to keep up with expenditures in five years? So looking long term, you know, at least a couple of years out, but uh, the rating agencies are looking at, do you have a five year operating budget? Yeah, but they've, off, they've always asked for a five year capital plan, but now they're asking municipalities to see a five year for that very reason. And on the right hand side, you'll see some um, bar graphs. And the point of that is, is there, there is a tendency, especially with a pandemic or in a downturn, to keep that low. And eventually, because of, you know, budgeting, costs keep going, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. But sometimes you end up with a big blip, because suddenly you have to catch up for the cuts that you've made. So, so in this example, the, you know, four or five years in, all of a sudden, there's a big blip. Instead of this nice, smooth line, because you've kind of planned ahead for all the years going forward so that you don't have that little dotted line you have like a blip in one year and of course if you're a taxpayer you like everybody else we have our budget and you kind of know what's coming next year and you may not mind so much if it just goes up every a little bit every year what you'll remember is that year where you really got surprised and you had to figure out how to add this to your budget and of course the opposite of that is a structural imbalance where you've you know, generated revenues that are conservative estimates. And you still look at your expenditures and you realize that in, it might be okay today, but this is what it looks like year come year, you know, three, four years out, we're gonna have to figure out how to adjust it. So should we start planning for that now, making some tweaks to expenditures so that they don't grow to that level or figure out a revenue stream that's going to cover it? So to talk about that, and sometimes, and, and the right side of that graph, there's a little pie chart. And again, because, because you are a service industry, typically 75% of your budget is salaries and wages. So unless you're talking about cutting positions, that's gonna be a hard area to cut. Or if you're going to not keep up with pay, you know, the pay that's out in the industry, people, people will move on. And so you've got to keep up that 75%. There's some room in the materials and supplies and, and of course in capital deferring that, but it does make it a challenge when you're in a service industry to really to um, avoid or just try to compress this situation when you know that the expenditures are naturally going to continue to rise if you're going to continue to provide the services that you have. These are uh, things that we talk about when we, uh, in, in upcoming, when you issue debt, to talk to your rating agencies. These are discussion points that we have with them all the time. So the time we like to talk about it are months before you actually go to a rating agency. So if there's policy to be affected or, or things that can be um, shored up a little bit, these are the kinds of comments that we have there. So just sharing that for that reason. And when we go to a rating on your bonds, um, we market the bonds and then we have a separate reading, rating with your finance staff, city manager, and they ask a list of about 20 questions, get the answers, take it to a different credit committee, come back, and they, you've got a very high credit rating that Chris will talk about later. Um, and that credit rating is what helps you get the low, lower interest rates on your bond so that the higher your credit rating, the lower your interest rate. And so it's important to try to do what you can kind of tune up your your answers and the way that you're managing so that when you get the highest rating from the credit rating agency so that's where some of this evolves from and some of your own policies the first thing is some practical budgeting when you're doing your structural budgeting is to not budget you know an ongoing item you're not not adjust a budget or fix a, a gap by using a one-time solution 
because next year that same cost is going to be there next year. You know, it's going to be there. And now you're even further behind on aligning the revenues to the expenditures. So to use an ongoing revenue to uh, fund ongoing costs. The second item is that stable thing. And it's really what we just went through. It just emphasizes it's stable levies. Look next five years out and make sure that with the levy that you're setting today is something that will be sustainable tomorrow and the year after that and so forth. We joke, some, once in a while, I, I teach a class at Hamlin and we show a, a levy and it shows uh, uh, a budget and then er, or a levy and then every third year, it's a big drop and then it goes way back up again. And then every three years it drops and then it goes way back up. And we, we call that uh, election year budgeting, you know? So <laughs> it's not sustainable, you get back up there right away. So the, uh, the next item is minimum fund balances for all funds. And, and that is for every fund, and we'll show you an example of this later on, there is a year end target and an ongoing target, but mostly we kind of measure those at year end of funds that you should have. And it has to do with how long do you have to carry on, cover all these expenses until your major revenue streams come in. Um, I think some, some of the constituents that you have will pull up a financial statement and they'll see this balance and it's like, why would you possibly ever raise taxes? And I think to have the full understanding of what, how long you have to carry that because you certainly don't want to do short-term borrowing. That's a really good way to lower your credit rating. So to make sure you have enough cash at your end uh, to, to cover the general fund, typically it's you know, looking at how long until the revenues come in, your utility funds, who need to operate, how many um, months would you need if a major, you know, to, to recover if a major uh, customer left town, that kind of a thing. And then do you want to build any of these funds so that you can build capital instead of always having to issue debt? So looking at a combination of that and coming up with a target. And the reason that's so important is if you're going to set a levy and you've done what you can with revenues and expenditures and you're below the target, you can justify the tax increase to say this is good management and this is the level we need. And the same for fees. You really want to justify any of the fees you set in your utilities by saying this is the target we need to hit. Here's your revenues, your expenditures. And if we don't set the fees at this or make these other changes, we're going to be below this reserve. Um, the next item is that any year where the fund balance is not it uh, doesn't comply with whatever you set for any of these funds. Um, and and I, I point this out because some people are afraid to set a target. It's like, oh, we're going to get in trouble if we ever miss it. And the, the target is to really uh, help you govern, help, help communities govern and, and uh, be able to be transparent on how you're setting the rates. Um, but if you ever are behind in a credit rating call, I will tell you, they, they care more that you get back to that within a few years. They understand the housing crisis, the subprime housing, everybody dipped into that. And that is your rainy day fund, it can be. And they see it a little bit, they saw a little bit in the beginning with the uh, pandemic, some communities were really hunkering down. So they understand those, those situations happen, but, just, but they still encourage a target regardless. Um, the next one has to do with the charges to entities um, or, get, you know, these are one-time measures or just really not being um, uh, charging the services where they belong. So some, some communities have, um, in a year where they're not doing well, they might have the utilities pick up more of what's really the general operations or charge more overhead to a project that gets paid for with capital. So these uh, funding solutions help you this year, but they really don't solve it the next year or the year after that. So to be careful also not to use those mechanisms to solve budget gaps and lean uh, harder on some of these utilities. Eventually the utilities end up having increases in their rates that are also too high and you have to justify those. So it's really about making sure you're charging the right people for the use of the, the project and keeping up with those on an ongoing basis. The next one is the, um, you know, I'm just going to tell you one of the reasons we're using your screen in this is we, none of us have printers in our houses. And so we're, <laughs> we're working a lot remotely these days. <laughs> so, that's a, been a luxury. Um, the contingency also is some, uh, one of the good practices that they recommend. And that is you build in a contingency for all your funds. And part of, you know, you can do that by um, on your revenues, being conservative, make sure 
you've got a little bit, you're, you're, you're budgeting just under what you think you're really gonna get. So you've got a little bit of room. So conservative budgeting. Um, same with expenditures a little bit, you know, to make sure that you've got enough room, you know, if certain things happen, but not budgeting for everything, but a little cushion. And also maybe even a better practice instead of, you know, overstating a little bit of expenditures is to just simply have a contingency that you spell out, you know, a dollar amount that any fund could borrow from if they, they were short that they could come to you on. But to make sure you've got some room in that budget is, is important so you can maintain those fund balances once you set them and you don't have to dip into those. Um, and the last item on this page, and you know, this is things that this is a topic, you know, good practices that can go on for days and days and days. And I'm telling you, we're gonna try to do all this really quick tonight. But the last one that we'll bring up to, for tonight is um, also when you're setting your levies and doing your long-term planning to consider maintaining all the assets that you have every community has miles, you have miles and miles of street, you've got public buildings that have to be maintained, you own a lot of assets. And so just to keep up with all of that, um, some communities, uh, you know, are, have set a policy such as we will always use, keep about 15% of our levy or our budget set aside for either debt or capital. And that way we know that in a year where we're not issuing bonds or we might not be doing a major improvement, we're still setting that aside for that purpose. So we don't fall behind on maintaining all of our assets. And that way, maybe you have some money saved up so you can bond less in the future or just make sure these repairs get done. Um, because like everything else, um, it gets more and more expensive. Um, when I was budgeting, doing budgeting in, uh, when I was a former finance director, the police chief was the biggest advocate for community services. And he said over and over again, my budget is okay. Um, I have to see who's in the room here. I don't know. <laughs> chief of police, give me a ticket on the way home for saying this, but, <laughs> but the chief of police used to advocate for community service and said, if you can put the money into the teen programs and all of these things that help help them become good citizens, you can put a lot less money into juvenile delinquency programs that I have. It's just a better use of money to be proactive. And the same with the public works director who would say, if you fix the street now, when it says it's due and we have the money and we push ahead on that, it's a lot cheaper than completely doing the whole street over in another 10 years because we didn't keep up with it. So that's the, the idea of you know setting a range and making sure that it's either going to capital or a debt service. Um, and the other fear when I was a finance director was that it would get used up for all the operation budget. And then when I needed it for capital, it would be seen as a big increase again. So that balance ongoing is helpful. We didn't, you know, if anybody has any questions, you can jump in any time, but we're just, this is a similar theme and it just talks about really what are those one-time and ongoing expenditures and revenues. And so the ongoing revenue um, that we have, you know, with taxes, the LGA fees, the things that are collected every year somewhat in a consistent way are, you know, exactly the funds that you can utilize for the ongoing expenses, which of course the biggest of those being salaries and wages. But anytime you have a permanent position or um, materials, you know, that have to go on, you've got ongoing street work, the, the maintenance. So, I mean, we've, we, uh, I like to tell war stories and I'm, I kind of do, but, you know, I've had a grant. You know, if you look at the one-time revenues grants, uh, where someone would hire someone and the grant is a one year and they bring on a permanent person. So it was only our problem to figure out how to pay them the rest of their career. And so that's, that does actually happen. Or uh, I had a, an HR director who decided to hold off on giving wages until really late in the year. And that way he gave them instead of 3%, he gave them 4%. And it was the same for that year to do it either way he could just give it to him later in the year. Only now the next year, everybody was starting at 4% instead of three, even though it worked for that year. So those, those things do happen. Um, and so we say, you know, if it, one of the, some of the policies are, if you come in with a grant that's uh, for police or the ARP care funds that are, have a limited time donation, sales of property, you know, certainly collect those revenues, but try to use those for special projects a lot of the ARP and CARES money you'll be talking about tonight are specific dedicated projects, not things that are gonna go on for the next 20 years. 
and for the capital is always a good use of that as well. This looks like spaghetti, but um, I will. Uh, <laughs> this is this is just another piece of the fund balance situation. And when we talk to constituents, again, that big fund balance, why would you need it? Um, is this a pointer? Oh, it's a TV. I didn't even realize that. I'm, I'm so old school, sorry. <laughs> so the revenues um, are the red, is the red bar. And hopefully everyone can see that. And what happens with revenues in local government is, you know, you get revenues throughout the year, but you have this big peak in June when you get your tax settlement, and then another almost as big peak um, towards December. But in the meantime, the yellow bar talk is showing you where the expenditures happen. And so they're a little bit less usually in the winter. Your big expenses are in the summer months when you're running the park and rec programs, but much more of a steady uh, flow of funds going out with expenditures. The result is that reserve that we've been talking about and why you need it. As you can see, it also gets higher right after the big June tax settlement comes in. But if you don't start from a position of strength in uh, month 12, and you can see where the reserves end up, you may end up really low um, come that fifth month just before your tax settlement. So that's, that's the reason for, and this is not Winona, this is just an example. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, if I could ask a question right here, uh, of fund balance requirements. So, are you do you are, are, do you have ongoing advice to us, or, or 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 can you? How can we determine where we should be at? I'm I'm keying in on on this particular topic here. This this, this fund balance requirements to make sure that that we're not saving too much. That would be a nice problem, uh, or 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 saving too little. How do we determine that? Well, the oh. I'll let Jessica start off. The expert here. So the we rely heavily on tax levy and LGA revenue, and we don't receive those payments until the beginning of July. So we have um, quite a few months that we have to get through um, before we we start collecting the main part of our revenue for the year. So. In my mind, we need to reserve um, about 50% of our, our general fund operations costs mm -hmm. um, so that we have enough time, um, enough money to make through to the beginning of July. And that's our general reserve. Right. Okay. We have other reserve accounts. Uh, um, uh, um, water, what sewer and water, I know is one of them. We must have rules or 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 traditions uh, uh, of how we have determined how much those fund balances should be. Would that be correct? Um, we, I think, part of what we need to do this year is to work through our um, finance policy on what those reserve balances should be. Okay. I'm kind of sensing that and in some of our previous, I'm, I'm new. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to wrap my arms around this, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm interested in that topic and we don't want to overdo it. We don't certainly don't want to underdo it. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay. And we, we have, you know, guidelines, but it's usually the fund balance is a, is a combination of cash flow and then looking at your long term needs and doing both. And so it, and, uh, and uh, Jessica has brought that up, you know, quite, you know, we've had discussions about that before. So this is right where she's going. And uh, Chris Hogan is talking to you about these slides. Yeah. So can you hear me okay? So when we think of debt, I think a lot of people think, oh, debt is bad. And, um, you know, and, and we would say it's not, a, it's, it's not bad. It's a great way to fund some big capital projects. Um, and I just wanted to, we wanted to illustrate today just what, what the impact would be on just a few, we just have a few scenarios here that I'm going to walk through with you. So we're looking, if you did some financing, we're looking at three options, a 10 million, a 20 million, and a 30 million. The same uh, term, so same repayment term. What would that look like at these rates? These are 
current market rates, what would an annual payment look like? So these are, you know, in each scenario you can see um, around 712,000, double that for 20 and then 2.1 million for a 30. So that's an annual payment, a debt service payment. So what does that mean to a taxpayer? So what we've done is we've calculated what the tax rate increase would be, and that's your bottom, almost bottom line. So say on option one for a 10 million, you're looking at a 3%. Um, option two for 20 million, 6% and 9% for option three. Do you wanna go down? Oh, we got all comfortable. So what does that mean for a resident? So this is gonna break it down. What does that mean for a residential property? We, I'm just showing a few, 150, 200, 250, and 300. So this is, it, this is an annual increase. So if you have a $10 million bond issue, um, an estimated tax impact for a $150,000 house would be $37 a year. And then right across that, you can see it's $77 or 115 for 30 million dollar bond issue. Then we have a breakdown of commercial market, what that would mean. Obviously they have a higher tax rate, so a little bit higher. And then apart, uh, we also show a couple apartment market values at half a million and a million dollar, what that impact would be. And then I'm just gonna break this down further to show you um, what it looks like per month. So the prior screen was the annual increase. This is showing what it would look like for a monthly increase in your taxes. So again, if you're looking at a, let's pick a $250 million residential home for $10 million, that's $6 a month. Option two, a $20 million home, that's gonna be $12 more a month. And 30 million would be $18 more a month. Again, I'm showing some commercial market value at 250. You can see the impacts there on a monthly basis as well. And the apartment market value, again, at a 500,000 and a million, and those are monthly increases. And this is, these are just scenarios today's time um, with what we would think interest rates are right at this time. So. Chris, can I pause you for just a second? Brad, is there any way we can make this bigger? I absolutely cannot see any of these numbers. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. I'm the only one without a screen right in front of me. Oh. <clears throat> of course, you're just the mayor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. Can't get in my office. Can't see the numbers. Thank you. These um, these are available. I think Lucy was going to make copies, yep. and they can be handed out. So you have those. That question uh, will tell. I guarantee that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Any questions on those? We'll move on to the next screen. The mayor just saw it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Digest it for a while. Did you want to keep it up on the screen a little bit in case you had questions? I'll look at it later. That's okay. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, the scenario that you just described, that is the best way, the easiest way to explain it to a taxpayer. And then you can compare that to a cup of coffee. You can compare it to milk, to a drink, whatever, a cigarette. That's the best way that you can compare that as to what you're paying for those products compared to what your tax increase would be in the service that you receive for that $10, $15, 30, whatever it may be. So absolutely, yep. Thank you. It's nice to break it down that way. You can relate to it well in a lot of communities or a lot of citizens don't think of it that way because they pay it twice a year so it looks like such a big number but um but that is why a lot of communities do that so that they can relate it to some of their other purchases that they make every month and we're just going to talk a little bit about the credit rating how important that is and uh um, when you're doing bonds, that's obviously really important. And everything we've talked about actually influences your rating. So everything, your um, fund balances, all of that does play a part in your rating. Um, Cities has a AA1 rating, which is fantastic. Um, this list of, it, it just is 
taken right from the Moody's report. This is from their last bond issue that they did in 2017. So they noted the credit strength of the city. And as you can see, um, these are the credit uh, regional economic center with institutional presence, strong operating reserves. And that's again, how that's really important. Additional liquidity available in the water, sanitary and sewer, sewer enterprise funds. Some of the credit challenges, they only really listed one, so that's good. Uh, low socioeconomic indices for rating category, um, and that's due partially to the large student population in the city. Factors that could lead to an upgrade, um, and just note there's only one upgrade because you guys are a AA1, so that's really good. <laughs> um, substantial expansion of the city's tax base and strengthening of the city's residential income levels. Um, moderate pension burden. And factors that could lead to a downgrade would be the deterioration of the tax base or weakening of the socioeconomic profile, material declines in operating reserves and in liquidity, or material increases to fixed cost burden. So just a little snapshot of what uh, rating agencies look at and your, this particular, for you guys, what your strengths are. So to that, I think the last screen we had, and I'm going to turn over to Chad, is to talk about ARP funds. Mayor, we'll see if uh, Brad can yeah, please <laughs> increase this. This slide. thank you, sir. Depends if George can still see it. it would, I, I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, Brad's got it. We're good. Thank you. Uh, so just some background uh, for council. Uh, we asked the department heads to submit um, a list of possible um, ARPA funding uh, projects or some cases services, some cases supplies. Uh, the premise there was I had asked all the department heads to do that. One, one philosophy that we could take is that we, we take these one-time funds and we, in a sense, spread them over all the departments as best as possible for, again, greater community um, outreach. Uh, that was one uh, initiative that we, that we undertook. So tonight you've really seen some of those items at a first glance. This is not a final list. We can certainly add items to this list. Um, our process from the staff level would be that we'd wanna show you these tonight because Baker Tilly is here if you have specific questions about any of the services or projects that are listed. That's one, two. I think it's important that we balance these items with our CIP and our 2023 budget process. And I say that to go back to one of the slides that, that Terry was speaking about. Uh, the first item on the list, mental health initiatives. Obviously, ARPA funds can be used for mental health initiatives. We've certainly had a lot of discussions around this certainly in the chambers here about uh, the art program and could art funds be used to reinstitute uh, that program. I've listed as mental health initiatives. We're gonna continue that discussion about uh, the art program, but as a reference, just to repeat, um, you saw on a previous slide, one-time revenue, long-term expenditure. And is that the best use of those funds? That's not to say that ART is important to the community or something that we would want to fund. That might be that discussion then that we should, in a more sustainable model, do that through our tax levy through the 2023 budget. That, that's one scenario. So you see mental health initiative, again, one-time revenue, long-term expense. Uh, the flip side to that, as an example, would be the largest project on this list is the Masonic Temple HVAC, which we've had a lot of discussion about, again, in this chamber is about, uh, should we do that project? Another example, based on a previous slide from Baker Tilly, one-time revenue, in a sense, one-time or capital project, that it, it, there is some alignment there uh, that makes sense to use those funds uh, for that expenditure. Again, we know we've got future years, but um, really a, a capital one-time time expense. I certainly don't want to, you know, tonight really isn't the night to have a discussion about should we spend 22,000 on voting booths 
uh, important. Housing rehab program, important. Um, items for our fire department, turnout gear, uh, library public Wi-Fi, all the items on here we feel are, are important and in, in the future we'll need to have those discussions. But you can see just from this list, uh, we have tonight, we're, we're really presenting $3.3 million worth of potential ARPA funding. And we're expected to receive 2.8. And so we're about 570,000 currently over, uh, over really, in a sense, over planning. I wouldn't say budget because we're still in the planning phase of, um, of this process. The, the last piece that I will mention, and again, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to go through all the items and I certainly don't want to show any bias, but I think one important, another important piece that we haven't really uh, discussed is uh, park rec loss of revenue. So during the pandemic, we did lose revenue in park rec, obviously initial um, ARPA funding recommendations and certainly uh, rules applied to well lost revenue. So that certainly is another area that if we if we wanted to take a look at fund balances, you know, currently um, it's estimated that Park Rec lost roughly two hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue during the pandemic. So that's another another feature: one-time revenue, also maybe in a sense a one-time uh, cost that potentially uh, match up. So um, I'll, I'll turn it back to Baker Tilly, and we can certainly come back to this if you have more detailed questions, but again, if I think if this is the point where Baker Chili, then we'll kind of comment on potential projects and how they qualify. George, George has a question. Yeah, just one question, Chad. Can any of these funds be encumbered? So mayor and council, in a sense, we are, in the term that we use encumbrance, we are encumbering these funds, but they do have a deadline to, um, allocate funds or or designate the funds, and then we have a timeline or a deadline to um, spend the dollars. So there is a timeline to when these funds can be used. Thank you. I have a question as well, um, and probably more anticipating public questions based off of this spreadsheet here. When we'll be talking about this? Uh, Mayor and Council, as I mentioned, it, I think it makes sense to do this through the budget process. And, and in some ways, a lot of these items are CIP items mm -hmm. and that this discussion continues to happen as we go through our CIP process, which internally will start next month. Um, I, I think, and maybe what I'm going to assume you're asking is if there's an item on here that you would like us to consider ahead of the CIP or this process, then we certainly can bring that back for discussion. So again, if you want to have Masonic Temple discussion in HVAC and is it a good time to, you know, is it a good time to go out for bid since we're already through construction documents, ready to go with the project? Um, we can certainly have that discussion earlier. I'm just saying to you, I think it makes some sense to do it through our CIP process. Um, at the earliest. Mm -hmm. and, and again, just for the public, when will that be? What months do we normally go through that process? So internally, we uh, discussed the CIP in May. Um, and then I'm going to defer to staff <laughs> on when it goes to planning commission and when it goes to council. Hi, Lucy. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The CIP goes twice to the planning commission. Um, so usually there's a joint meeting with planning and council in the June, end of June timeline, beginning of July. And then after the council is further through their budgeting process, it goes back uh, for final approval in September mm -hmm. to the planning commission. Very good, thank you. Oh, Michelle, sorry, go ahead. I don't really know if you're looking for input, but I just want to go on the record and say that we should do the Masonic Temple HVAC. I think um, we're a long time, my gosh, almost 14 years from me, we've been working on the Masonic. And now we're for certain looking at the seniors occupying there for at least the little foreseeable future, five years, whatever it takes to finish a plan and make a decision about building. And I don't think that building can be used in any real way with a non-functioning HVAC. And even if we thought we would get a new building built in two years, 
the thing might break and then we're, we're, we're going to be struggling to find the funds. So I do, I think that you guys put together a really thoughtful list of items that this, and I can't really have a problem with anyone, although I will agree that funding a long-term employee with this money does not make sense to me. I think the way you phrase mental health initiatives could be something other than the art um, individual. There are probably lots of programs that could be used for that, but I will say the bottom two in particular, the park rec loss revenue, um, that, that bothers me a little that we have a negative fund balance. And I know some of that is because we planned buildings that haven't been built. And it seems to me that using the funds to offset that cost makes a lot of sense, especially since part of that is the Masonic and the senior center. I just wanted to go on the record of saying that because I think those two should stay on the list and the rest I'm up for debate, but those two in particular, I think are very reasonable. Anyway. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I, I completely agree with uh, um, Michelle and um, I, along with George worked pretty intensively on the art program. And I think we've, during the last budgeting pro process, it was made very clear that that needs to come back, but it's something that needs to be supported by our budget. And I think the point made um, by, or the example given by um, uh, the ladies from Baker Tilly is that um, investing in something like a community health initiative will actually save money in the long run. And so I, I will, I very much hope that um, we will see that come back on the budget as a budget supported um, item. Thank you, Eileen. Okay, we'll move on. Thank you. Um, I think that, that um, just, <clears throat> I guess the one thing that we wanted to say is that we are reviewing the list uh, along with the city staff um, we have a team that worked with Chris and I to look at each individual line item to make sure that it complies with the guidelines that are there. You know, in big picture, the, the funds are used to help with health concerns that are related uh, due to the pandemic and to also serve the community, especially populations that have been disproportionately disadvantaged by the pandemic and then to shore up operations that have been harmed by the pandemic. And you're doing a combination of all of those on this list. And part of our team is, you know, based on feedback that we hear tonight on the direction that you want to go, we've looked at the, H, the, the, the two items that you've talked about, um, the HVAC project, especially at the Masonic Temple, and they do qualify. And we believe everything on the list qualifies and what we're doing is providing staff with the, the um, citation within the code of each of these items. And that will come back to our team is working on that as I speak. Go ahead, Terry. Terry and Chris, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I probably could have asked this a hundred times we've met, I'm sorry. Um, based on those comments, something came to my mind that I wanted to ask. Um, as an example, if the Masson Temple HVAC project were to come in, at, um, bids came in at, let's just say for discussion purposes only, um, 2.3 uh, million. Are we allowed to allocate the 1.8 from ARP and then use other funding sources to complete the project? I, I would assume the answer is yes, but just wanted to clarify that. Yes, it's um, a lot of things that you do are, are helping to shore up something that might have a total cost. And so certainly if it comes in higher, yeah, you, would, you could still use this towards, towards the project and then come up with your own funding for the remainder. Are we allowed to bond as an example for the uh, just for this example, the 500,000 is, is a bonding a mechanism to cover any shortfall? Yes. So what, what is happening, and we're doing this all over the state actually, is a project that folks are planning to bond for. Um, they are using, you know, let's say they have a $10 million project or multiple projects, and they want to use about a million and a half of their AR, ARP funds. We'll show this as a source of funds. And so, you know, we come up with your total cost. We'll show that as a source of funds in lieu of the bond amount that we would do. So it would just shore it up. 
Steve. Uh, I'd like to make sure I understood you correctly that, that you reviewed each item on this list and it, it uh, complies with the uh, ARP rules. Is that right? The, the menu of items have mm -hmm. been looked at and in the yeah. overview, they do comply. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, George? <laughs> uh, nothing available for streets. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are not. Um, well, go ahead. You were going to say something, Chad. Oh, I was going to say it wasn't on the list, but I would say they are not. They are because you can fund those through a mechanism that exists, roads and streets. Those have not been on any of the ARP lists. They've been. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, George. Any other questions? No? Anything else to add, city manager? Oh, George, go ahead, one more. Just one more thing. When you talked about uh, uh, the tax structure and the, you know, the cost of your property tax, I have, <clears throat> I have three phone numbers by my phone, the county assessor, the auditor, and Jessica. <laughs> when they get in depth, uh, that's who I tell the call. <laughs> Thank you. Very good job, ladies, both of you. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle, you had a question or a comment? Not really a comment, just a question. I, I used to tell Mary Berichter that my favorite part of the year was when um, Bob Bamanick from the county would come and talk to us about how the outlook of the, the city and the county. But the other is when Baker Tilly comes because we get information we need to make good decisions for our community. And I really appreciate what you put together here that you worked with Jessica and her staff because it's phenomenal. It's helpful. I think anyone listening will get a really good, simple understanding for how taxes work and what we're able to do with them and how they really affect them on a, on a monthly or yearly basis. And it's information that is not um, ever overstated from our perspective. Hearing it more than once is never bad because it does get confusing when you look at those assessor sheets that come, it can be a little confusing. And then you're trying to add up in your mind with all the other taxes you pay, how it works. And this was great. So thank you for coming to do this for us. Thank you for having us. Um, this is fun for us too. You know, uh, we always say we charge you the same whether we come out early to do the bonds, it's a fixed fit schedule. And this is the fun stuff is helping figure it out, put it together and come out and do the bonds later and building up a, a, a partnership with your staff and with you. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. One thing I'd like to mention that is probably obvious, but in general, elected officials are not experts at finance. There may be one or two or maybe sometimes none, uh, but th these type of services, not only what Jessica does for us and her staff, the city manager does for us, but also having consultancy groups come in like this and do thorough explanations that are I don't want to say basic, but in layman's terms, you know, and, and in general, those will not only help us, but also help explain these things to the public. And so, um, you know, Michelle, how long have you been on council? Almost 14 years. Yeah. And I don't even want to ask George forever and ever. Amen. But, <laughs> but they've been through this and, and Pam and, and uh, Eileen have been through these as well. So not only do you have new elected officials that have to learn these processes and make decisions based on information that we're receiving from staff, but also we have people who are not experts in these fields. And so again, thank you. Great job. And, uh, Appreciate you coming down tonight. So go ahead, Jeff. Mayor and Council. Terry and Chris, was that the last slide? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure there was no, <laughs> I couldn't remember. I think it was just the question answer. Okay. So again, if, you, if anybody has any other questions. Sir. Very good. Thank you. And with that, we'll end the informational session and we'll reconvene at 6 30. Thank you.